Welcome to FOSS North, the virtual edition. We would like to thank all our sponsors and partners in this difficult situation. Our gold sponsors, Luxoft and Ansible by Red Hat. Our silver sponsors, ITRS Group and Make It Right. Our base sponsors, our partner projects, the open source community and the region of Gothenburg. And a huge thanks to our awesome community. This would not have been possible without you. Welcome back everyone. So next up is Bolaji, who will talk about effective documentation and why that is important in open source project. So the stage is yours. Welcome. Thank you so much, Johan. Um, hello everyone. My name is Bolaji Bolaji and today I'll talking about effective documentation in key to open source growth. So um, just so you can follow me, you can just scan this QR code, you can the link to the slide already, and then you can just scroll along. So I guess you can see this, you just scan quickly and um, let's roll. So yeah, a little bit introduction about me. So um, I work at a company called Hashnode as developer evangelist and outreach. So basically, my role revolves around making my company happy and making developers in our products happy. So um, you can call me a happiness engineer. I ensure my company is happy and developers in our products are happy. So yeah, um, I'm a full-time developer and technical writer. And yeah, I'm also community manager at Open Source Community Africa. It's a community of open source enthusiasts in Nigeria and also an accessibility jumpstart in docs and free and open source Africa advocates. So that's pretty much what I got. That's pretty much it about me. Uh, okay, so just a quick introduction to what we'll be rolling through today. So um, first of all, we'll run along through introduction to open source documentation. Um, the meets of open source, understanding user personas, the effective documentation strategies, um, bad documentation checklist, good documentation checklist, and some documentation tools I would recommend you should try out. And yeah, what next? So um, so basically in open source documentation is the information that describes the project to its users and contributors. So um, there's an emphasis here on users and contributors. So your documentation serves two purposes. There is documentation for your users and there is the one for your contributors. So we're talking about open source here, and I'm sure you're familiar with what contributors would mean and what users would mean. So this is basically a quick introduction to what documentation is in general. Um, so before I proceed, there are some myths in open source I would want to outline now, and I'm sure we might be familiar with that. And one of those myths is open source is the responsibility of the creator alone. So like this, like this is this is everywhere where people feel open source is just about the creator. Um, um, there's this tweet from Angie Jones like a couple of weeks ago, and she said, someone asked me if it's true was open source, and I excitedly said yes, and began to tell them how they could contribute. They looked puzzled, and they didn't actually care if it was open source. What it meant was it is free, and funny how everyone wants free but don't want to help you with it. So like there are several engineers and developers using open source projects. They just believe it's free, free and open source projects, but they don't really want to contribute to it, and that's a need. Um, open source is just not about the creator alone, it's open source, so we'll get to that. And secondly, there's a myth that open source is just about code. And this is really, really false because open source is not just about code. It encompasses um, all the planning that goes before writing the code. You, you don't just sit and then just say, ah, I want to build an open source project from nothing. You have to do some planning and, oh, I have this idea and then I want to put it down to something. So it's a process that goes even before writing the code itself. and there's a process that go while writing the code and a process after writing the code. So open source is not just about code. We have design, there is documentation, there is so much more that goes into open source, even marketing and funding, so much more. So yeah, open source is not just about code. And so, so yeah, so today we are talking about effective documentation and how it is a key to the growth of your open source project. So um, we're going to be doing something like, the first one is understanding user personas, like, one key to building great open source documentation is understanding who you're writing this documentation for, because this varies across different projects. 
I might have an open source project, like a very small project, maybe a library or um, just a package, something small. I understand that my persona is just maybe developers just wanted to try something out or something. Like my audience is just very little. And you might have um, a very complex project, like let's say a storybook, and then your audience is very much larger than just developers. So the first thing to build in effective documentation is understanding your user persona. And I outlined like, a couple of personas we're going to look around today. And the first one is end users. So who are end users? Um, the final consumers, people using your project. And one thing you should know that an end user doesn't have to be a developer. So you might be building an open source project that is eventually going to be used by just random humans, one actually not developers. So let's say, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Sugar um, or Music Blocks from Sugar Labs. So um, it's an open source project that's being used by kids. So those kids are not developers, but like they're the end users. So if you're writing a documentation, you need to understand that, oh, I'm going to have an end user at the end of my project. So you should consider them also while preparing for your documentation. Um, the next one we have is developers. Like I'm sure this is the one we eventually um, think we are writing our documentation for. We focus a lot on writing for developers. And this comes when you're thinking about having contributors. So in every open source project, you have contributors. And then you're writing a documentation for developers. and this can cut across different range of developers, beginners, intermediates, and all that. I, I, I will, I will, I'll explain more around that in a couple of next slides. So designers. So this differs around several projects. So your project will determine if your user persona will include designers. Like I said earlier, um, these personas I'm listing differ for projects. I'm giving you a general list so you can look at it and see, okay, which of these personas apply to my project? For a small project, uh, you might not be writing documentation for designers. If your comp if your project have um, some sort of design contribution, then you should also write some documentation for designers. How do they set up the project on either Figma or Adobe? Like how do they contribute and all that? So you need to consider them also. Um, so next we have technical writers. Um, people most time wonder and say, how can technical writers con contribute to open source? And I'm like, what? Um, Documentation itself is open sourced and then it's been managed by some people and those people are going to be writing and obviously you would need technical writers to also contribute to your project. So you also need to understand that you would have technical writers. How do you create your projects that it is welcoming to them? Okay, let's imagine your documentation is um, written in Markdown. So um, what guide do you have for technical writers to understand how to contribute to your open source project? Because I might not be familiar with working in Markdown. Possibly I just familiar with writing normal text and I didn't know about Markdown. So the documentation has to be welcoming for me to understand, oh, it's Markdown. This is how Markdown works. And it should be so much beginner friendly. We'll roll across that in um, next slide to come. So um, program managers. So where do program managers fit in your project? Um, the role of a program manager is obviously just managing a project and making sure everything runs from start to finish. So as the program manager, I am looking for tools that would make uh, my engineering team scale. I'm looking for tools and products that would increase like, our workflow, right? So when I'm scanning through for some projects, I'm like, oh, how can we simplify this? How can we automate this stuff? And then I just, oh, let me just make a research for a, a quick library that can just help us automate one or two things. And then I find the projects. As a product manager, I am a user and then I have my own reasons of coming to your projects. I would explain more around these users and what they want while coming to your project. So you need to understand that program managers are also coming to your project. And next we have financial contributors. We have like an awesome and amazing community in the developer ecosystem right now, whereby we are all supporting each other in terms of learning, in terms of open source and so much more. So we have so many companies, so many individuals who are supporting open source projects financially. So we have some financial contributors who are looking out for successful and thriving projects to sponsor. And so how do you create your project in the sense that it's welcoming for financial contributors is one thing we would also look around because they are also one persona. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So, and this is an interesting part now. So what do these user personas want? What do they actually want while coming to your project? Um, you need to understand, first of all, what do they want to get out of your project? Um, what solutions does your project offer to them? Um, what could be your initial visit mindset? And um, okay, so let's let's go to the three points. So the first one is what do they want to get out of the project? I mentioned for an end user, an end user just wants to use the project. I don't really care about what technologies. 
you used to do. I don't really care about installing your um your, your code base. I just want to see the finished work. So the documentation at that point is explaining how to use your project. How do I use this? How do I use that? And that's all that matters to an end user. To a developer, you're explaining how to set up the code base, how to install this, how to run this, how to set up this, and all that. So your documentation to a developer is quite different from an end user. And then um, just to go back to the user personas. And for designers, it's quite different. I mean, a designer doesn't really care about your code base. They just need to understand um, the design part of your project that needs contribution. How do I set up um, either Figma or like, what tool are you using? How do I contribute to your designs? How do you use GitHub and all that? That's all what you're writing for a designer. For a technical writer, you're explaining you're explaining what well, what pertains to them. A technical writer just cares about whether or not your project uses Markdown and all that. How do they contribute to the technical part of the project? And program managers just want to see um, how thriving your project is. So as a program manager, I'm looking for a tool or a library that would um, automate stuff for a workflow for my company. And then I just I just search in GitHub some turning profits and just search for this social so library and then I find yours. So I'm scrolling through your project, trying to see if it's worth trying out to my company. So my, my goal at that point is not to really try your, 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 your project out. But I don't want to try out several projects. I want to understand that your project is worth it for me to try. So you need enough information to tell me and convince me that, oh, this project is this and this is what it does. So um, in the next couple of slides, I'll explain what you can do around that. And then for financial contributors, we all know that they don't really want to know how your project is built. They want to understand the history behind that project and what exactly you're doing with the project and how thriving has it become, like I said now, what, um, what statistics do you have? What have you achieved so far? And um, you need to understand that, wow, this project is doing well enough. Like we need to sponsor them because um, the creators are spending their time, their money, their energy and all this, let's sponsor them. And then you just want to see all that information. So what you put out for an end user is different from what you put out for a financial contributor. They all want to see records and statistics around your project and all that. And so you need to put in mind that they want to see you need to understand what they want to get out of your project. That's the first mindset they come with. And then what solution does your project offer? Um, is your project a library? Does it help people to automate something? Does it help people to do this and all that? You need to understand that first of all. And then you need to understand what could be the initial mindset. Like I mentioned, each user persona comes with a different mindset to your project. And um, the next thing you need to understand is where are these user personas coming from? Like how did they find your project? Now, like I mentioned earlier, all these are uh, plans you make before writing your documentation. You need to understand this so you can make sure you have an effective documentation. So understand where your users are coming from. So first of all, are they coming from search engines? So for me to come to your open source projects on search engine, from the search engine, it obviously mean I have a mindset. So I did not just go to Google and just search, um, um, let's say, um, or storybook and open source, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't just randomly just type random words and just stumble on your project, even though that can happen. So I obviously went to Google to search for your project for a reason. It's possible I'm looking for um, what tool can I use to build some um, UI components in isolation? And then I just found Storybook. Like, so I, 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 there was a query that brought me to your project. So understanding where your users are coming from, the first one is from search engine. And second, it can be from social media. This is very, very common. So when a creator builds an open source project, they usually maybe tweet it and say, oh, I did two stuff. Or they post it on Reddit or other social media platforms. Or they post it on Hashnode and say, oh, I did this cool stuff. And then I just check it out and say, oh, oh, nice. So I can just stumble on the project on my timeline and just click on it. And then at that point, I don't have any mindset sort of. I'm just clicking to try and um, figure out what's up with your project. So. Notice the difference between search engine. For a search engine, there was a query. I, I I was trying to find something and then I stumbled on your project. From social media, I was just scrolling through my timeline. And let's say someone I um someone I know retweets them, retweets that tweet, and I'm like, oh cool, let me check it out. I just click on it and it just what's this and what's all that. I just scroll through. So at that point I really don't have any mind. But funny enough, your project might be um something interesting that I would want to try out. And then by scrolling, I might just say, oh my God, where has this project been all along? I, I, I've been looking for this. And then I just try it out. So understand, next we have social media. And then next we have backlinks from other sites. So this is very common. Um, basically, a backlink is just a link that's a link from one site to another site. So let's assume um, I built an open source project called X, right? So, um, and then in another website, let's assume an article or something. I can reference that article. In the sense of saying, oh, have you seen this open source project? It can help you do this and that and that. And then 
it's listed in an article. Let's assume I'm reading that article and then I get to the point where that link is inserted there. I just click on it. My mindset is quite similar to the person coming from social media. I just stumbled on it and notice the difference between social media and backlinks because for you to click on that link, it means you've read out through the article and that link it's sort of related to what you're reading about. So when I check through and I see, okay, this is quite similar and I just click on it and then I just move straight to the project. I have like half mindset around what I'm looking for. I'm looking for something to relate, um, something related to the article I was reading and then I just check on the project. So that's the third um, location from where your users are coming from. Next is we have package managers. So we have tons of open source products around packaging, um, packages, JavaScript or Python and other languages. So um, we, just, we have NPM, so like NPM is a package manager that holds all, trade, um, all JavaScript packages. So um, a very common way for me to stumble on your project if it's a package is by searching on package managers. Um, let's say I just want to find um, a new package that can help me automate something. I just go to NPM and just search about that and then I find it. So this is quite similar to search engine, but it's quite detailed. I understand that I am looking for a package and not just looking for um, any random open source project. So I go to a package manager to find a package. So my mindset there is to search with a particular query, just like search engines, but for packages. So these are four um, ideas around where your users might be coming from. So next you need to understand is how much time you really dedicate to your documentation. And this is very crucial in helping you prepare for an effective documentation because when you look at it, an end user doesn't really have so much time. Like, it's possible someone recommends that product to me. Let's say Music Blocks, for example, which is um, a tool for, for kids. So I'm a kid. I really don't know anything about your project. Someone recommends, oh, I've just seen this product out. Like, I'm not a developer. I just checked it out. And I'm like, oh, cool, awesome. All I care at that point is just using your project. So any documentation you should prepare for me at that point should be as um, little as possible because I really don't have so much time to read so much documentation. I just care about your product. So if you uh, prepare any documentation, maybe any um, notification, tooltip, and all that kind of stuff, it should be very brief. Just show them, okay, when you join. And a very common um, fact um, factor among this kind of project is products that have end results, like an open source project, like a music block, like it's an open source project, but like there's an end result that people use. Like an open source project like Storybook, it's more like for developers. So we like use it on our own personal projects, right? It's not really consumed by end users, right? So while I'm coming to your project, I really don't care about how you build your project. I just want to use your project. So whatever documentation you're preparing for me at that point should either be inside the application itself or like before I start using your, your application. You don't have to redirect me to a page to read the documentation before I come and download your application or and all that. So next is how fast do they want it? And then user wants the, the documentation as fast as possible. For a developer, they want it as fast as possible also, but like it doesn't mean you should increase the speed of how they should read it. Like a developer wants enough information about how to set up your project, right? So while considering the speed at which you want them to read your documentation, you should also consider you need to provide enough information. So this speed varies across um, the length of the information are provided. So if your documentation is, um, if your project is easy to set up, you really should calculate, um, how long does it take for me to set up this project and how long, how can I optimize that? So it would differ by project. So you won't say because, um, this project takes and took me three minutes to understand how to set up and then yours should take three minutes also. Yours might have a longer setup and then it might take you like, let's say five minutes. That's fine. Understanding your project is one first key. You need to understand your project and how it works, and then you can now determine how fast they want it. Um, for like financial contributors, how fast do they want to read your docs? If financial contributor doesn't really care about um how to set up, what text you're using, they really don't care. They only care about okay, um, what does this project do? Um, what made you build it? Um, what have you done so far? Um, how thriving is your community and all that. And then they just want to see the statistics and then that's all. I just decide, oh, I click on your Patreon link or your open collective link and I sponsor you. So you understand that your financial contributor doesn't really have enough time to read so much about all your documentation. And then next is how fast can you have them? So this thing is like, it's, it's more like a personal analysis you do before writing your documentation. Now you understand that your um, users want your documentation in like three minutes. Now you understand that. So how fast can your documentation serve them? It's one thing to optimize your documentation for your users. It's another thing to ensure that your documentation serve them. Because for, um, let's say, a developer, right? 
what I want to get at the end of your project is two things. It's either I am trying to contribute to your project or I'm trying to use your projects for my own personal project. So I'm either trying to install your projects to mine or trying to set up your code base so I can contribute, right? So I have two mindsets there. And what you're trying to serve me now is provide information on how I can install your code base or install the finished product. That's two things you're trying to serve me. So now you understand how fast I want to get this thing because you understand that I just want to set up, right? And then you now understand how fast can my documentation serve them. So this can also work if you already have some sort of documentation set. So you need to like reiterate and understand how fast is my documentation serving my users or my developers. And <clears throat> the good way for you to understand this is by running some sort of survey. You can do some documentation to understand, okay, get some developers who are active or who have been using your projects for like a year or a few months. Ask them, how fast did this documentation help you? You can even get people who are not, you can, you can get these user personas, each of them and ask them to like run tests on your documentation. You can get an end user, you can get a developer, you can get a program manager, a financial contributor to try out your documentation and give you feedback on what you feel you can improve. So like, you, you, you don't have, you don't tell them, Oh, I want to check if X or Y. You just tell them, go to this documentation, tell me what you think. How did this serve you? You have your questions already. How fast? How fast was it able to answer your questions? Stuff like that. You need to be able to run some analysis and survey before starting out with documentation. And this is what many people fail to do. We just open some readme file, just type down some stuff, blah, 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 and we're done. And then we just ship it out. And then you never can tell if it is actually serving your users or not. But you just believe you have some sort of documentation. And I think there's a difference between um, good documentation and documentation. And that's why I, 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 I titled this talk effective documentation. You might have a documentation, but it is not effective enough. So how do you know if it's effective enough is what we are discussing right now. So a first thing you need to consider also is how fast can your documentation respond to your user issues? So one thing you should understand in, in this sense now is when it comes to contributing to projects or using projects, um, there are times where your projects will have issues. People have feedback to give back to you. How fast can your doc respond to their issues? Okay, if you use GitHub, um, there is an issue system that people use to report issues, bugs, and all that, right? How fast can you respond to them is also um, being it's it's liable to your documentation. So when I come to your docs, uh, I've seen um, projects whereby someone creates an issue for a bug or so, and then there's no feedback for like three months, six months. Like that's pretty not cool. And I should get enough information on your documentation on how soon you can respond to me. I've seen docs that um, you it tells you, oh, if you have any issue, you either open an issue, we'll get back to you like in 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 some days and all that. Like your user should understand how soon you can respond to their issues because. This is also part of one reason why they might be coming to documentation. Because for example, let's assume I found your projects from um, a package manager like NPM. I possibly might not have stumbled on your exact code base, right? So I just installed from there. And at some point, I have some issues with your project. I want to um, get help. At that point, my mindset for coming to your open source project is just to get help, not really to install anymore because I've passed that stage already. I just come to, oh, I need help. So your documentation should also explain how and where I can get help. Do I need to reach out to you via email or just create an issue? Or how long will it take you to respond to me, even if it's just an estimated time of response? Or if I have more questions, do you have some sort of community? Do you have some sort of Discord channel or Discord server or Slack? Like whatever, all the um, social media spaces, I can reach out to you for more help. Like it should be included in your documentation because that is one mindset people can come with. And then... Lastly, you need to consider how satisfied will they be? And like I mentioned earlier, you have to find this through a survey. You need to understand how satisfied your users have been so far. You, you analyze for both um, end users, developers, program managers, financial contributors, and all the user personas you can, you can come across for your project. Understand how satisfied they have been over time. And then one other thing you need to understand why preparing for documentation is how technically CV, uh, your users. Now, in terms of users and contributors, you need to understand that first of all, there is a category called newbie, and then there's a category called beginners. It's quite totally, totally different. So for a newbie, I have no idea about your project or what it does. So let's say any open source product relating to Android, I really don't know much about Android, right? So if I stumble on your project, I am a newbie. I really don't know anything about that project. And then you have to explain the bits and pieces of each from the start, you need to explain how and how your project come across, what does it do and all that. That's for a newbie. Now, how we, um, a beginner is slightly different from a newbie in the sense that I am not really a beginner to tech, but like I'm a beginner to your project in the sense like, let's say, um, 
I'm fluent in JavaScript, right? And then I have little idea about what Ruby does, right? Or Ruby on Waves. So me coming to your project, I am no longer a newbie, but like I am a beginner to your project because I really have no idea about the technology you're using. But like, I might want to use it at that point because let's say I'm starting out a new project in Ruby or trying to learn something around Ruby and then I just check out a project and then I'm like, okay, all right, wow, what do I do? So at that point, I am no longer a newbie, but like I'm a beginner to your project. So there's a, a slight difference between a newbie and a beginner in the sense of documentation because a newbie has totally no idea about what the product does. And most times, end users fall into the category of newbies because they really don't understand anything about your project. Um, developers most time might fall into the categories of beginners. So understand that this is the second um, technical strength you might get. And then the third one is intermediate. So intermediates already have an idea of your project, right? It's possible when intermediates are already learning one tech or the other, and then I'm trying out, like let's say in, in, in the JavaScript world, so I already know React, and then I'm trying to learn Vue, right? Then I'm like, oh, I already have an idea of how React works, and then I'm trying to check out Vue. So I'm an intermediate, right? Because I have an idea of how the old JavaScript ecosystem works, right? And then next we have expert. So it's very easy to, uh, why well, you need to understand how technically savvy the AI is. That will help you in deciding how lengthy or how effective the documentation will be because for an expert, you just need to provide them with little information. Like they've been working for like years and they understand how to set up and do all that stuff. You just tell them, this is it. You really don't need to tell um, an expert and say, oh, you need to NPM. Like an expert doesn't really need to see you write NPM install something. I just need the package name and I just install. For a beginner, I might need you to write NPM for me because you might even need to reference um, a documentation or a link, a backlink to something that explains what NPM means for me because I really have no idea. And like I mentioned, this varies across several projects. But understanding all this would help you determine what strategies work best for your project because you, you, you would then determine, okay, is my product being used by beginners and newbies? For a project like, let's say, um, um, let's say a JavaScript framework, right? It's assumed before you use that framework, you already have an idea of JavaScript, right? So you, you won't assume that you have newbies in that particular because it's like the, the project is based on something else. So it's assumed that before you can even learn this, you must attach to that, right? So you, at that point, you understand that your documentation should be focused more on intermediates and experts. So, all these user personas and all these strategies will help you understand which works best for your projects. For a, a small and very little project, you might need to consider newbies and beginners. Or for like a very complex project, like something really complex, you might just consider intermediates or just experts. You never can tell. So understanding what works best for you is really, really, really great. And the last one is just um, those who call, who say my code, it's a code. Those are like really, really super professional. We've been doing it for years, 20 years, 50 years. Like you can imagine. As a slight difference between experts and this category, so you can, yeah. So now I've outlined, we've outlined um, some of these um, user personas and what you should consider. So the next thing you should look around is what effective documentation strategy should you follow to ensure that your documentation is actually effective? Because um, from all of this so far, you can understand that it's possible your documentation is not effective at all. It's just standing there, just a readme file. You never can tell that if it's helping the users or your contributors. You, you never can tell. So first thing you need to understand or you need to do to ensure that you have um, an effective strategy is first of all, define the vision of your project. So now, this varies across several projects. So what are the core reasons people are engaging with your project? What, what, what was the history behind you starting your project? What, what are you looking at the project in the next couple of years? So a project like, um, let's say Storybook, right? I've been using Storybook before. I, I use them a lot, okay? So let's say the idea behind that is to help people build um, UI components in isolation, right? And then what vision can you look around that? Okay, in the next three years, I want all front-end developers to be able to utilize my product. I want them to be able to use Storybook to do all they want to do, to um, build all kinds of UI components they want to build in isolation with so many features and so many features and all that. Because at the point of releasing open source projects, you really don't have a finished product, right? And we can take you from products like um, Quick Sandbox, like if you um, read the history or any story from Ivan and um, Ives, you would see that at the point of creating Quick Sandbox, it was just a small project, right? It was just, you were just trying to mimic um, VS Code and bringing it to the web, right? Something around that, right? So at that point of starting the project, it just had like few ideas and few features, but like you already had some really cool features in his head and maybe you already was thinking around, um, okay, in the next couple of months, I want people to be able to run an entire project on Code Sandbox without having to do anything else. Maybe at the early stage, his idea was just to create an editor that works on the web. 
And then but already I'm an idea, okay, in a couple of months, I can now add a feature that allows them to run a project on the web. So understand what vision you have for your project and keep that in mind. That's the first thing you need to do. And then next, you need to define your target state. So um, one thing you need to understand is be clear and realistic about your documentation goals. Don't try to do too much. You don't need to because um, we've talked about effectiveness and then you just want to have like a documentation of like um, 5,000 words or something around that. Like, no, understand your target state and be clear. Be realistic. You should do what you know you can achieve. For a small package like, um, let's say, um, a JavaScript package or something just so little, you don't have to worry about lengthy documentation. You just type something small that is effective on its own. So being effective doesn't mean it should be bulky. It doesn't mean it should contain um, too many information. It just means it should contain enough information that is needed at that point based on the user persona. So be clear and realistic. Don't try to go overboard here. Understand what works best for your project and then be clear. What do you think you can achieve? So in the first uh, month, let's say you plan on just having a documentation on the readme file. That's fine. And then you already plan that in the next couple of weeks, you would have like a docs page, like something complex. Like at the point of starting your project was little, but like you already assumed that, so, oh, in let's say six months, my project should have um, grown so much. And then I will have someone who will be using it. I need to provide enough information. That's a goal. Be clear and realistic. You would not try to now create the documentation page at the early stage when it's not really needed, but it's a goal. You understand that you will need this in the next six months, but be clear and realistic. Don't try to go overboard here. And then, Next thing is do a gap analysis between your current state and your target state. Like I mentioned earlier, it's possible you already have a documentation now. So understand what is my target state? In the next six months, I want my documentation to be able to serve like 1,000 users. Yet it contains enough information about my project and how to set up and how to use it and all that. That's a target state, right? So be clear. Do an analysis between where you are now and where you hope your documentation will get to. So analyze your current documentation and then notes the differences down. What is what what what, what lapses can you um, can you identify? Is the documentation not getting enough views? Is it um, based on all the surveys you've done? Are people um, users are they complaining that um, it's not serving them well enough? Are they complaining that it's too lengthy? All those surveys you've done now note the differences between where the documentation is now and where you want it to be in the country based on your target state, right? So note down those differences, and then. After noting all those differences, the next thing now is to tackle those differences. So you need to introduce some approaches and processes to reach this target state. Because you can't just have a target state and expect that in the next six months you will get to that target state. You need to make some efforts or make some plans and some processes to ensure you get there. You, you can't just say in the next six months, I want X, and you're not making any plans to get X, right? So um, you need to introduce some, some processes, right? And like I mentioned earlier, these processes would vary. I already mentioned them while talking around the user personas. It varies across projects. When you understand your user personas and understand their mindset, what do, they, what do they want out of the documentation? Now you have a clear understanding of what you're doing. So it's now time for you to introduce a process. How can you improve the documentation? Do I need to, um, do I need to add more links? Do I need to introduce something much more than text? Do I need to create a separate and unique page for documentation? Do I need to add some animations? Like based on your feedback, your surveys, based on um, all the analysis you've done so far now, start introducing policies that work best for your project. And we already listed so many of them down. So um, the next thing now is set up and execute those processes, right? So you understand what to do now, right? You've outlined some processes you want to face. So now the next thing is to set up and execute some of those processes and one thing you should know when it comes to uh, executing documentation process, it starts small and prioritize sustainability. So one thing people feel when it comes to open source products is they don't consider um, what would happen in the next six months. So like, so you have a documentation right right now, like you just created a project, and then in the next three months, what do you think will happen to that project? What do you think will happen to the documentation? Is your documentation going to be maintained by yourself or contributors? You need to understand that why is executing these processes, you're executing plans that prioritize sustainability because you want your project to continue in the next couple of months. So it's possible I'm um, right planning you might now introduce, okay, do I want to get someone to work as the documentation maintainer on my project? Do I need to get a volunteer or so? You need to consider all that. How do I sustain my documentation? Is something you need to consider while preparing and executing these processes. What um, plans can you ensure with them? To, what, what plans can you um, put in place to ensure that your project is sustainable, right? Quality over content, like uh, quality over quantity, like this. I am not saying you choose quality or you choose quantity. 
what I'm saying now is this would vary from your project. Your project might need quantity and minor really need quality. Your project might need quality and minor really need quantity. So let's say um, a very popular project, right? Like I mentioned, a very complex product. I assume that you need to have passed through one stage to get to that product. Like in a total newbie cannot just come and want to, let's say, Use a project that involves GraphQL, right? It's assumed that you obviously have passed through building some kind of APIs before. Or like you should have an idea of how APIs work. Possibly you have worked with um, REST APIs before then. So like you're, you're no longer a newbie, but you're just a beginner to GraphQL, right? So at that point, you should prioritize quantity. I'm sorry, quality, because like I don't really need too much. Like I don't need too many lengths of text. Like I have an idea of what I'm coming to do. So what I want is quantity documentation. I hope I'm not confusing you. I can hear you, but like, I hope you follow it. So you need to provide, um, quality at that point to your users. So it needs to be so qualified that they can understand what they're, they're looking for from your product at that point. But like, for example, beginner, you need, you might need to add, um, so much quantity of documentation because I need to understand, um, what the NPM is. I need to understand, um, all the different packages you're using, like all the basic and basic and basic and basic stuff you're doing. And now, now be thinking, how do I ensure that I provide documentation for each user personas? Because you might not want to have them all in one documentation. Like I mentioned, you might want a unique documentation page for your project. And then we have categories. You can have a quick start. And that quick start is useful for people that fall into developers and experts. And then you might have like a full guide. You might have like a complex guide. You might have a deep dive guide. Like you can have several guides that is like you encas, um, you like abstract several information into different guides. So like for beginners, they want the full guide, right? So you put all the entire information there. For developers, you can put theirs in a quick start guide that just contains how they can quickly set up. So these are the kind of things you should, you should also consider around your documentation. And then one other thing that works best is leverage on other technique aside text-based content. This is one thing people fail to do. You need to introduce stuff like visual documentation. The documentation should not only just be around text, like you need to understand also that the user personas have different mindset. I might not like text so much, right? And then when I come to the documentation, I am bored. And then you should now do your analysis, you understand that your docs is not serving me. It's possible to serve me at the end of the day, but it's not fast in serving me. Because I hate text, but I'm not so confident, I'm comfortable with reading so much text. I might get tired, like, in, let's say, five minutes of reading my documentation, right? So introduce other um, techniques. Visual documentation, you can work with animations and illustrations and videos. You can introduce, um, um, use cases. So, um, where is your product being used so far? Introduce, um, projects that have been built using your, um, your open source product, right? Show people how your product is being used by the global um, ecosystem. Show them working samples. So like, um, okay, my product helped you to do this, helped you to do that. Okay. How has it been implemented? So I have some working samples that show, okay, this is an implementation. You can just set up a sandbox, a code sandbox that shows you how to implement the entire project on something, right? And then I see a working sample. And then you can also add testimonials. So um, like I mentioned, for like a program manager, my mindset at that point is to figure out if this project works well, like if it will work well for my company. And if I now find a fellow program manager as a testimonial on the project, I'm just like, oh, I know this guy, or I know this, I know this lady, right? And I'm like, oh, cool. So long he has used this project and I can try it out because I believe it works for him and it worked for me. It's like it's help um the program manager at that point to get what he wants from the documentation as simple and as fast as possible. So you need to you need to always roll back between each of the strategies we've come here today because it rolls between your user personas, their mindset and your strategy. So roll through those three and always iterate back and forth. So understand that each and every um strategy you make is going to affect each and every user persona you have listed out for your project. And the next thing to add is metrics, like I mentioned for financial contributors and let's say um program managers, they want to see metrics, right? As a contributor, um I want to support your product. I need to understand that it is worth supporting, right? And one way I can figure out that is by metrics. Show me how um we have um um five thousand downloads, we have um several these are the projects that have used our products and this is all and all that. We've we've been around for like one year now and then we have reached this, we've achieved that and all that. So Add these metrics for them because each and every other person will rely on different techniques. And that's why you need to do an analysis on your own. So if you have a documentation currently now, you need to go back to your docs. Um, if you have possibly a maintainers, have a meeting where I treat and like we re reevaluate your plans again, come again and say, okay, you're starting a fresh documentation. We want to do this, we want to do that. And it's not the strategies together. 
and then come up with something new. And like I mentioned earlier, sustainability this is key. You need to understand that there should be a sufficient plan and community to maintain the documentation. I've had projects whereby I just try to check out the documentation and then I'm like, oh, how to do X and Y. And then I check it out and then I realize that the documentation is redundant already because let's say like last week they shipped a new feature and then it's obsolete already. So you need to understand that your documentation should scale while your project scales because it won't serve me that way. It's possible that that documentation was serving users like three weeks ago, but now you've implemented a new feature and then something else needs to be implemented in another way. You need to scale your documentation while your product is scaling. So I should not come to your documentation and then figure out that this doesn't work anymore. And I'm like, I have to create an issue or I have to, I, I have to complain. I'm saying, oh, this is not working. I, you have to tell me, oh, 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 um, it's redundant. Like, it's not cool for um, your users to figure out and find out that your documentation is obsolete. Ensure that you have a sufficient plan to maintain the documentation. And you can do this in several ways. You might have a small community of technical writers that can um, volunteer to help you. You can have bounty programs, like if it's a very, very huge project, then where you call for technical writers to help you improve the documentation. There are several programs around that now. I'll explain some at the end of my talk. And then you can have all that and then make plans. So um, what developers mostly do now, I just build the stuff, I build the project, and then I just open source, and then that's how this. I just write my documentation myself, and I'm like, that's all, right? But you need to understand that you need to make plans also for your documentation. You need to understand, okay, I need a volunteer documentation maintainer. It might be a friend, it might be anyone. Like having these plans now will ensure that your project will be successful and sustainable. And then also one thing you should understand is build a community around the documentation. I have said several stuff around this now. Um, attract collaborators, sell your vision, recruit help, and simplify your contribution process so that like, you can have a community around the documentation. Um, one project I love so much is Open Collective, like the documentation um, community is really, really awesome. Like it's just like an entire department on its own. It's like it's not all about engineering and writing of code. Like create a small community of documentation um, experts, beginners in your project, and then have them brainstorm together, fix issues for you and all that. Like in the long run, you find out that you're sustaining your project. Um, okay. Yeah. Automation and track version issue. Like this is very important because in analysis, you need to understand where your product was in the last week and where it is now. Like I mentioned, understand your target state and your current state. So one way to understand this also is by tracking your, your, your history, like versioning your project, your documentation. You need to be able to go back and see what your documentation looks like three years ago and understand, okay, this is where we were before, and this is where we are, and this is where we can be in the next three years. So ensure you're automating stuff and you're tracking your changes. And so quickly, let's run to some checklists. So how do you know if your documentation is bad? Very simple, right? First of all, if your documentation doesn't scale with your project, it's bad. I mentioned this already. Ensure that your documentation scales with your project. And next, if your documentation repeats stuff, like you should not be repeating, repeating, repeating. If you're repeating, ensure you are categorizing them. Like I mentioned, you can have quick start guide, full guide, deep dive guide, like different guides for different personas, right? But I should not be seeing the guide for um the food, the full um the full um the food um full guide in the quick start guide, right? Like you should not really complex make it complex by including different patterns at different points. Ensure you don't repeat stuff, right? Ensure you are categorizing when it comes to repetition, right? And then next is, if your documentation is so ambiguous, like, it's bad. Like, I just come to the documentation, I'm like, what? Oh, my God. Like, just so ambiguous. Like, it would really, really not be cool. And next, if your documentation is not inclusive enough, like, it's not good. It's bad. Like I mentioned, the newbies and the beginners, you need to understand that a newbie has totally no idea of your project. So you should ensure that you have some sort of guide for them to understand how your project works. And recently, I was working on some documentation for project, and I literally defined, like, Every single stack I used in it, and I was like, oh, React does this, um, Storybook does this, um, this does that. Like, I literally defined all of them and added external links. So I could categorize that, right? And then a newbie can easily go there and understand that, oh, this is it. You need to understand that documentation takes time. As much as you're putting time into engineering, you should put enough time also into documentation. It's not just about writing readme files. It's like an entire job on its own. You need to put in enough focus to the same focus you put into engineering the same focus you put in the documentary because it takes um the same level of time like all this planning we've mentioned so far you can see how complex it can be right 
And then if it's missing contribution guides is bad. If it doesn't include support links, how can I reach out to you for help or reach out to your community for help? It's bad. If it doesn't respond to user issues in time and there is no estimated time of response, it's bad. I should not create an issue and in the next one year, I've not received a response. I understand it takes time and the process around this, but like ensuring that your users are aware of your availability and your availability at every point is very crucial. So let's assume like um, in times like this, due to the, uh, the pandemic around the world, and then let's say you're spending a lot, um, some time with your family, you don't have enough time. In your docs, you can add, um, I will be unavailable at this point. I'll be available around 1400 to like um, 1700. If you have any issues, ensure you ask. I'll check them during this time frame. So the users already come and say, okay, it's not available now. He'll be back by this time. So I can really just sit back and say by 1400, I'll receive a response. And I'm cool with that, right? Yeah, that's all around bad documentation. So if your, your documentation doesn't satisfy, like if your documentation has all this, it's bad, really, really bad. So how do you know if the documentation is good? The first thing is if it's, the documentation is good if it can answer all these questions. The first question is why was this project created? What problems does it solve? How can I get started with it? Um, where has this project been used? Um, who are using a project? Some live use cases. I mean, this is a working samples, right? And then how can I contribute to your project? If you can answer um, these questions, right? It's good to go. It's a good documentation. So you need to ensure that your documentation can answer all these questions. Once you can do that, like, you're good to go. And then I'll recommend some documentation tools you can you can use for your project. You can check out some, um, I, I, I don't know, it can vary by your projects. You might be using Markdown or so. There are several tools like Gitbook. There are several tools around, you can run around documentation. And you can use GitHub also. You can use any kind of tool you want. And one important tool I usually recommend is um, all contributors bots. So it's a kind of um, automation bot that ensures to welcome and um, include all your contributors. And most time people forget to add people who contribute to documentation. You just say, um, you just add the code contributors or the financial contributors. Like all contributor, um, all contributors, but ensure that every kind of contribution is welcome. So you can check it out at just Google all contributors. Uh, I'll provide a link to my slide later on so you can check it out. So what next now? What you do now is define a documentation vision for your project and prepare some goals because I don't know how much complex your documentation is, but like sit down and define a vision for your project and prepare some goals and then view the community around the documentation and ensure that you prioritize sustainability at the earliest stage of the project. So once you do this, you get to go. Um, so like I mentioned, there's some programs around I would recommend that you check out, like Google Season of Docs. It's like a program that ensures um, students and all can, um, can help contribute to the documentation of your project. So if you have um, a project um, and then you need help with documentation, you can apply. I think there's a session um, going on for this year and then you can Google would support you by bringing in students to work on your documentation. You can check it out. And if you are a user or a contributor, you can check it out also. And the Google Docs product is a project currently ongoing to, um, to create um, some kind of templates and like guides that you can use to ensure your documentation is effective. So like, I'm sure you might be wondering, um, all this thing is complex. How can I easily get started? So the Google Docs product is working on some kind of templates and like quick stuff. You can easily just walk around and there's always some starters and then just walk around. And then this is a logo for um, the um, all contributors bots I mentioned earlier. And yeah, so the documentation should provide users with a roadmap to using the project. Cool, right? So documentation helps your users to succeed with your software and it empowers them to be self-sufficient. It enables them to give you further feedback and it is the organizational backbone of your project because the user feedback they give is what will help you to improve your project, right? So ensure you put in, um, the same amount of time you put into engineering, you put that same amount of time into documentation. I'm sure you're putting enough focus into that. So um, thank you to all of you listening. Thank you to Icons 8. I got some of my amazing illustrations from them. Thank you to the organizers. And thank you. That's it. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is Henrik. So <clears throat> I have a couple of questions for you. Are you ready? Yes, I am. Okay, lovely. Uh, Here's a uh, question. Here's... Excuse me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, oh, um, okay. The, they seem to come in a strange order here, so I'll do my best. Uh, okay. Oh, uh, 
How important do you think it is to translate documentation to other languages than English, uh, for example, Swedish, Russian, Chinese, to people that do not speak English? Yeah. All right. So, um, like I mentioned earlier, I I I I, I told you to ensure that you create some kind of strategies and it's very about project. And like I mentioned also, each of your user persona comes to your project with different mindset, right? So, if your project is um, originally in English, let's say you're from England and then you speak English, right? And then I'm from, um, let's say, um, a country like, let's say, um, from China, right? I speak Chinese. You understand that I might not be able to flow so well to documentation. And this is where analysis come in. You need to understand where your users are coming from. Until you do that, you won't know if your project needs translation or not. So let's assume you've done some survey, you've done some analysis, and you understand that you have like 20 users coming from China. You have like 50 users coming from um, India. You understand that people are coming from different regions with the way they speak different languages. That way you can now decide that, oh, I need to translate. So like translation is very important if your project needs it. If you analyze and run some survey, you understand that your project needs it, please translate. Like it's very important. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Okay, mm -hmm. next one is uh, would public would documentation be best as text text with screenshots or videos on YouTube and where to best publish it on the project's wiki, GitHub page, or a book? Okay, um, it's quite similar to my answer again. Understand what works best for your projects. Like by default, every documentation is in text, right? Like that's default. For now, if you understand that by text alone, the documentation is not effective enough, based on your survey, let's say you get like 50% um, good feedback, right? You understand that you need to do something much more than just text. You need to understand that, okay, some of my users are complaining that they didn't really flow so well with text. I want something um, visual or I want some working samples. It's possible that the community shows me how to set up. I really want to see how it is how it is being used in real life, right? So I have a different mindset. So your survey will also help you understand which um, strategy to implement. So like there are several techniques. You can ensure you use illustrations and visuals. And if you look at my slides, I, I really love illustrations so much. So if I am using documentation and you have so much visuals, like I'll be so interested to check it out more. And screencasts, videos, show me how to set up your projects. It doesn't always have to be NPM install this, NPM install that. Prepare some screencast that shows me you and I, I see a human working on it and I can see it's going and then I like I feel like um someone is talking to my feel um I feel connected to the documentation. Like it's more and it varies across the project. Understand your project, run a survey on the documentation and then come across and come come come, come with several strategies and techniques you can implement. And then yes, you can host um your videos on YouTube, you can Post your um, documentation on GitHub. I, GitHub is one thing I recommend always. Like whatever tool you're using, most often they have an integration um, service allows you to integrate documentation with um, GitHub. Um, stuff like GitHub or a um, couple of other tools, they allow you to integrate the documentation with GitHub. Make it public so you can also get contributors, like I mentioned earlier, and ensure that you're tracking every change you're making. And that way, yeah. So if you have any, any more questions, you can reach out to me. I'll provide links after now. I can answer your questions. I hope this helps. Okay, uh, what do you think about organization conferences, meetups like uh, writethedocs.org, et cetera? Okay, what do I think about these organizations? Excuse me? Um, the question says, what do I think about these organizations, right? Yeah, uh, like uh, www.writethedocs.org. Okay. So um, writedocs.org is an awesome organization. Um, I have this um, open source project I call um, um, Awesome Text for Writing. So like it's just a list of couple of text for writing um, tools, projects, organizations you can check out to um, improve your text for writing skills. So one of the organizations I mentioned there is Write the Docs. So they have conferences, they have podcasts, they organize meetups and all around um, documentation. And what you should note is you might not be able to attend those events physically, but you can attend their podcasts or listen to the podcast and some other of their initiatives, right? So I would recommend you check out by the docs. And I also have some other communities listed out in this project. I will share a link um, just after my talk and you can check it out. I hope this helps. 
Okay, and the last question here. In your experience, which FOSS project uh, has the uh, do best documentation? Um, which project has the best documentation? Yeah. <laughs> That's a really <laughs> tricky question. <laughs> That's a really tricky question, you know, because um, I've used several projects and then I've come across several amazing documentation. And then one, I can, like, I can boost off anytime it gets me JS. Like, it's awesome. Like, really, really, really awesome. Like, I've been able to get me in, like, before now, and then it was really easy. Like, it's just amazing. That's it. That's me JS. And then there's so much number, like, I would just vouch for that speed. Okay, I guess I will leave to Johan to uh, finish this. So thank you for now. Thank you. Yep. More. So if you have more questions, you can reach out to me on Twitter at um, I am and I'll be so very happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And with that, I would like to thank our speakers, our sponsors, and all our viewers.